Well, welcome everybody to our uh, Gaia Education Glocalizers webinar series. My name is Giovanni Charlo. I am the e-learning coordinator at Gaia Education. And I have the great pleasure of uh, bringing today this webinar by Ezio Gori, who is a facilitator in our uh, ecological design courses and also in our design studio online. Ezio is gonna give a presentation on the public sector and ecological design how the synergy for SDG acceleration can be implemented. Uh, there are a few things I'd like to mention. Uh, one of them is that we are running a promo for those who are watching this uh, webinar right now. There will be a 10% discount on any of the products that you buy from Gaia Education, including all our publications, the books that you see there on the screen, but also the SDG flashcards that we designed for uh, uh, implementing community dialogue around the uh, UN SDGs. There is also a multiplier's handbook that can be used alongside with the SDG flashcards to create those uh, conversations that are needed to bring our communities closer to sustainability and the uh, 17 SD sustainable development goals of the UN. In addition, uh, we have uh, programs that run online. These are the full design courses in uh, sustainability. They cover social, ecological, economic, and worldview design. And they are offered in three languages, as you can see right there on the screen. So visit our website. We often run discounts on these programs and they are very complete and very thorough programs. The next one, for example, starts in January and January 14, you still have time to register and to receive an early bird discount of 20% on the price of the course. Um, Ezio is the facilitator of this ecological course alongside with Jacqueline Fletcher. So that starts January 14, please visit our website. We are also quite active in uh, many social channels uh, social media channels, uh, like the ones you see there with the number of people that we reach in each of those channels. So this is a very wide global community and we invite you to visit, join, uh, subscribe to our newsletter, uh, which is uh, published four times a year on the winter solstice, uh, spring equinox, summer and fall. And uh, the next one will be coming out next week, as a matter of fact. So come to our website and subscribe if you haven't done so yet. You can also become a certified trainer with Gaia Education by following uh, three uh, steps, which involve a face-to-face -face course uh, called the EDE, taking uh, an EDE, taking one of the online courses to narrow your specialty in sustainability design, and taking a training of trainers course to learn about the methodology and pedagogy that Gaia Education uses. Having completed those three uh, elements, you then will qualify to join our certified trainers roster and your profile will be put on the website. Uh, so when people need somebody to bring into their training, they can contact you. So today we have Ezio Gori. Um, I've been working with Ezio many years now on uh, teaching the online courses. Ezio is a project manager and sustainable development consultant with some 30 years experience in the development field and has used sustainable design principles on a wide range of projects from infrastructure service delivery, integrated housing and rural development projects and organic farming uh, uh, projects. He facilitates the ecological dimensions of Gaia Education Design for Sustain Sustainability online course, and he also facilitates the design studio of the same online course. His qualifications include a Master's of Science in Construction Management and a Diploma of Applied Permaculture Design from the UK, and he is a member of the Chartered Institute of Building. He is passionate about teaching permaculture and sustainability with cutting edge best practices gleaned from travels to eco villages and training institutions in South Africa and abroad. So I want to welcome my good friend Ezio and hand over the presentation to you Ezio. Welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you Gio for this opportunity. 
Um, I'm going to show my screen now. Um, There we go. There we go, yeah. So thank you again for this opportunity to present um, this webinar. And I think as background, uh, a lot of the slides that uh, are in this presentation, I have used several times for to sensitize the uh, civil servants. And I've added a bit more for this evening. So there's a lot of familiar material to uh, Jets type uh, students. So if you can just bear with me with some of the pictures and slides, I'll go through those quite quickly. But the thrust of the presentation is just to see how this information has been packaged that can be tailor-made for the, the public sector. So let's look at the webinar context. I think we're probably talking to the converted. So defining sustainable development uh, should be quite easy for us to understand. It's development that lasts. This is what the World Bank says. And um, it's development that allows the satisfaction of all the needs of a generation without compromising the ability for successive generations to satisfy their needs. This is the UN. My opinion is that as long as it improves the quality of life while living within the carrying capacity of supporting ecosystems, we do quite fine. The critical thing is that there's often an imbalance where we need to subsidize the ecological footprint from somewhere else. But this subsidization is no longer, in principle, is no longer sustainable and acceptable. Then more recently, we see the, the UN coming up with these sustainable development goals. And uh, all nations have subscribed to these. That was event happened in September 2015. And then the COP21 agreement in uh, 2015 again in Paris, where most nations have agreed to keep the global the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees uh, above pre-industrial levels. If we look at what the built environment um, contribution is to the, the development impact, it's quite significant. So um, about 18% of fresh water, 25% of wood, 40% of fossil fuels, and 27% of energy is generated through the built environment. So it makes sense for the built environment to start becoming more and more sustainable so it can start mitigating climate change by addressing the SDGs and so on. Um, so I believe that the public sector is, is well positioned to lead the implementation of the SDGs. And, and they should actually be tasked to lead the way um, throughout all spheres of government. And in doing so, they, they should be able to co-opt the private sector, NGOs, CBOs, etc. However, if the public sector is not well versed in sustainable development, as we have seen in many quarters and many nations, then the private sector also fails to adopt these principles, and that can set a whole country backwards. And those of you who are following what the targets are and what achievements have been done about towards the SDGs. I think all nations have got a, a, a little website profile on what they're achieving. Some of them have hardly recorded anything. So I think, just my opinion, we're a bit further behind than what we ought to be in order to mitigate uh, climate change. Now we have Gaia Education who's developed this incredible knowledge base about sustainable development. So how can we use this wealth of knowledge and leverage it within the public sector? So, in other words, how can the public sector lead the charge by example? So, the public sector is there to provide the, the regulations, you could say the policy, the strategy, the regulations for how things are done, so that the private sector can then continue and add, add value to it. So, we need to ask the question, how can this knowledge base be infused within the typical public sector infrastructure delivery systems in order to drive the SDGs. So this presentation will focus on these aspects. Where can we pitch this knowledge base at which point within the, these kind of uh, public sector systems? And now we're talking the built environment is, is, uh, also includes transport, energy, utilities, and to some aspect also agriculture. 
Um, let's just give a little bit of a background to how these public sector systems actually work. So in South Africa, what happened was that there was gross underspending of, of a lot of funding by the, pro by the provinces and national departments. So National Treasury, who was uh, monitoring the funds and handing out the funds and making them available, they decided run about uh, 2004 onwards, and they did a lot of research and they came up with the infrastructure delivery management system, which was basically a system put in place and designed so that money could be properly spent by these departments and properly budgeted for. So this is what the, the IDMS, uh, the acronym for the infrastructure delivery management system is about. It's often referred to as the IDMS bubble. And this gives you an idea of how government actually works. It looks quite a complex system, but in the center here, we have three systems. We have an asset management system, which manages and supposed to track all, it's basically a, a facilities management uh, system. We have a planning and budgeting system. This is because budgets are allocated on a year on year basis, depending on the availability of funds, but they are in terms of uh, short and, and medium and long-term expenditure frameworks. And then we also have a supply chain management system, which is essentially all about procurement. So these are systems, they're all interrelated. But projects are driven through this outer cycle here. We start off with a portfolio management process, which has all the projects uh, per department and all the long-term projects, and then program management, which uh, siphons off the, the immediate short-term priorities, and then those are delivered, there are other operations and maintenance projects to maintain the assets, or there may well be new greenfield projects, depending where demand is, or if a project really needs to be more than maintained, in other words, refurbished or extended or upgraded or whatever, then it's conceptualized into a project. So these are project delivery processes. Now, the outer skin on that is all about performance and risk management. How do we man uh, monitor and evaluate what is happening inside here? Because politicians rattle off targets that have to be developed and delivered. Those are all translated into projects and budgets, and then that's how we monitor performance. And the outer skin here is what's called the institutional governance uh, system. This is the oversight body from political heads, heads of departments, senior management, and downstream. So it's important to understand, it's almost like the, the layers of an onion, how this thing can be unpeeled, and where do we plug in this sustainability knowledge base to make the most impact in these systems? Now, the IDMS was only guidelines until recently. In what happened around about 2015, the government realized people are not really, or the government departments, Many of them are flouting the IDMS and they see them as guidelines. What more could be done? So Treasury then introduced what they call the Standard for Infrastructure Procurement and Delivery Management. The acronym there is the SIPDM. So there's no real image to describe what the SIPDM does in relation to the IDMS. So this is my interpretation of what it does. The, the SRPDM provides the regulations for how to manage the guidelines. Essentially what it's done, it's provided the teeth to enact the guidelines. So what the regulations or the standards say is that the IDMS now has to be adopted by all organs of state. So that means the entire public sector. And so even the Auditor General now, all they do, they monitor what the, the standard uh, says has to be done, and then they refer to the guidelines for how it should be done. So if one has to make an, an impact on the public sector, the, the, the easy, nasty way is to go to the regulations and say it will be done. Whereas the guidelines are more flowery and they say they give you guidelines for how it can be done, how it should be done, and then it becomes too much of a gray line. But the two go hand in hand. You can't have regulations without guidelines. And similarly, you can't have guidelines without being forceful and having regulations that actually enforce it. So my chance to, to uh, make this contribution to the IDMS came up pretty recently when 
National Treasury decided to co-opt a few uh, technical assistants like myself uh, to revisit the IDMS guidelines. Uh, it was also known as the toolkit and um, to see where we could add value and update um, these guidelines. But I saw then that the IDMS was pretty silent about sustainable development. It didn't say much at all. So here was my chance to, to try and influence the IDMS through the environmental, economic, and social sustainability aspects and how to integrate this within the IDMS bubble and the, the SRPDM uh, regulations. So then the key learning outcomes for this webinar, um, I've pitched them at three levels. So if you look at the, the contents there, um, items two and three, they start describing the institutional system and the performance management system. And I believe these two are, are locked hand in hand. So the first learning outcome there is to understand this critical relationship between the governance and performance. Because without having a baseline to measure, there can't be, um, you can't measure what you do. And also without good leadership, they won't take responsibility for achieving targets. So those two go hand in hand. Then the next learning outcome, item two here, is really entrenching this whole systems thinking approach for portfolio program and project management processes and looking at that through the lens of the project cycle. And then a fair amount of the presentation is spent on item six, which is looking at examples of ecological economics, which embraces the four capitals, which is the natural, built, human, and social capitals. And then we finish off briefly with uh, conclusions and questions and answers. So just to unpack the institutional governance uh, system, I like using this quote about the world will no longer be divided by the ideologies of left and right, but by those who accept ecological limits and those who don't. So this is a good welcome to the Anthropocene and if political leaders don't understand this and heads of department on, don't accept this, then they ought not to be in those senior, very senior positions. So we do need to pitch this uh, type of presentation to senior management, political leaders to make sure we get the, the leadership buy-in to enact the SDGs. Without senior um, leadership, nothing will happen. So it's important that they, that they buy into this process. And they need to be made aware of the SDGs, that all the countries have signed this up. And it's, they've been specifically designed to address climate change, but in, within a framework that delivers environmental, uh, social, and economic uh, sensitive projects. The challenge here, though, is eco-literacy. Not many public civil servants are actually aware of the dire impact of our ecological crisis. You know, they live day by day, and the reason why they don't have to do anything about it is because it's not in their performance contracts. If overnight we start including the SDGs in their performance contracts, we'll see, you'll notice changes happening very quickly. And maybe if they see how bad the situation is, I mean, if you want your grandchildren to be alive by, by the end of the century, they're going to be in an environment that's five degrees warmer. That's clearly not possible. We, we will barely make it above two degrees. So why aren't we feeling more anxious of doing something uh, positive about it? And I've put here these uh, black swan images. In project management language, we talk of, of black swan events. These are unpredictable events with catastrophic consequences. So for example, Fukushima, Chernobyl, and a couple of these big uh, cyclones, uh, Katrina and so forth, these are all black swan events. You can't see it coming, and when you only realize after they've hit you how bad it is. But we know this climate change is coming, and yet you're not doing anything about it. So it's also eco-literacy, it's an understanding of the climate change tipping points. Uh, we need to be well-versed about these. So we, we start getting anxious, and especially when we start noticing the, the, the ice that's melting in the, in the Arctic, the glaciers that are retreating, the methane that is burping through, uh, the effect on the jet stream, the circulation systems, 
and the ecosystems that are being ravaged. You know, this type of information and eco-literacy needs to be in the face of these politicians and senior managers so that they actually start changing. They, they, a lot of them aren't aware of these issues. They don't want to know. Um, and then there's also this concept of uh, abrupt climate change. The, it's happening far faster than what we would actually like. Um, so if you can imagine these black swans appearing uh, closer to the horizon than uh, what we would like. And in order to mitigate this whole lot, we need to really start thinking um, the whole time about climate change adaptation and mitigation in whatever, however we package and deliver uh, public sector projects. And now here in um, these three bubbles that I'd like to explain how we can achieve this as an overarching strategy. We need to create an enabling environment. So this is an environment which builds resilience and cuts carbon emissions. So it's all about putting the right policies, strategies, and regulations in place. So it's adopting whole systems, ecological design, green building standards, renewable energy policies, uh, economic relocalization policies, um, carbon taxes, energy descent planning. You know, most of these um, nations, they plan about growth. It's all based on growth. Uh, we should start planning about energy descent um, uh, issues. And then natural resource uh, protection. Now, there's adaptation measures, which are local actions that minimize or prevent the negative impacts of climate change. These are things that we can do locally and relatively easy. Retrofitting of buildings, ecological sanitation, rainwater harvesting, and sustainable urban drainage, renewable energies, urban greening, and local organic food production. Whereas the mitigating actions, these are global actions that reduce the emissions that contribute to climate change. Here we start looking at uh, a larger scale of things like mass public transport, decentralized energy infrastructure, new green build, regenerative agriculture, carbon sequestration, and wilderness restoration. So this is the mindset that we need uh, buy-in from, from senior management and, and political leaders. They need to think the whole time uh, about this concept of mitigation and adaptation. If they don't, they at least better be aware of risk management because risk management should be embedded within the governance structure. So that if we see we're not meeting the SDGs and we see temperature, runaway temperature changes, we must be aware of it. And this is where I feel systemic risk of, risk of climate change is not being acknowledged out there. And this is where the precautionary principle is one that should be adopted. And now the precautionary principle basically means uh, it's generally designed to avoid unnecessary risk. So really we see this runaway temperature increases that have been predicted by the IPCC. And yet we're not really doing enough about it to, to mitigate it. So the example I've shown below here, and just please just treat this as an example. Uh, if you start scenario forecasting, Imagine an environment where, or a scenario where you have a high ecological footprint um, and then one that shrinks to within biocapacity. So this is the polarity on the horizontal scale. And on the vertical scale, we have the Gini index. Imagine the Gini index being an index of ecological footprints across nations. And we look at a, a ecological footprint among nations that starts shrinking and one that keeps on expanding. So in other words, we have those nations that use five, six, seven planets starting to use even more. And those poor countries that are hardly using anything, they start using even less. Now, the ideal quadrant here is obviously the sustainable quadrant where we lower our overall global footprint within our biocapacity, and we narrow the gap between ecological footprints among nations. Here we have an ecological footprint of nations converging to biocapacity, minimal resource conflicts, and low Gini coefficients. 
The opposite extreme, the ecocide scenario. The third world tries to emulate the first world, runaway consumption, overshoot, and ecocide. There are two other scenarios as well here. We have a stagnation scenario, where the first world is swamped by the third world, and, and then you have resource wars, where the third world is plundered of resources. These scenarios are actually actively happening. And in the South African context, uh, Zim, our northern neighbor, Zimbabwe, uh, is a failed state. And about a third of Zimbabweans are actually in South Africa. So South Africa has accepted probably close on 5 million Zimbabweans, which is 10% of our population, which is causing a big strain on our resources. At the same time, if Zimbabwe had to be redeveloped, they've lost their best engineers, their best doctors, their best teachers. Where are they now? They're all working in South Africa. They need to go back. Do you think they'll go back home to redevelop the country? No, they won't. They'll stay in South Africa. So by allowing this huge influx of people, you, you start losing the human uh, resources from, from nations. And likewise, the resource wars is also uh, not a nice example or scenario to be in, but Zimbabwe is in this scenario. They've depleted the human capital and the transnationals are in there plundering and so are many rich nations just stealing all their mineral wealth and, and ripping it out of, of the country. So I put these scenarios together to, to shock people, to say, let's not move down to the eco side. Let's do everything in our power to move towards a sustainable uh, quadrant. You could also choose other scenarios, but it, this is a nice um, scenario forecasting technique to use uh, for risk management. So these are all governance issues that one needs to be aware of. Um, the next thing, let's look at uh, sustainability within the performance management system. So there's global accountability now. And uh, there's a famous quote by, I think it's Paul Beckwith, who says uh, he's a climate change specialist. And his quote is, uh, what's, what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. It's got ripple effects all over the world. We have um, the permafrost that's, that's caused from it. Um, the um, ocean currents are changing. So one can't ring fence the Arctic and say, um, you know, it won't affect the rest of the planet. And similarly with global accountability, all of us need to be accountable, every single nation. And the mechanisms are put in place by the UN to actually report on this. But the baselines need to be sharpened up so that we can really perform against the big targets there. Then we've got ecological and carbon footprints that are also a good measure of how we do against our bio capacity. And there's a happy planet, so there's also the overshoot uh, day. Um, the overshoot day this year happened on the 1st of August, as you can see there. Then we have the happy planet index. This is a, a really nice index to use um, to see how well the country is using its uh, biocapacity in terms of its human development index. So even though this graph is a fairly old graph, um, it actually tells an interesting story. Um, here we've got all these very rich nations, Norway, Canada, Australia, USA. They're achieving a fairly high human development index. There they are sitting at about common nine, maybe common nine five, but they're living well beyond their global um, footprint. Whereas here we have Cuba, who's living within their biocapacity and achieving a, a very high um, human development index. How are they achieving this? And this is, these are the countries that I think have got a bright future that these richer nations can learn from. So these are just other indices that we ought to measure our performance against. We've also got a green star rating. Now these are designed for, for buildings and most public sector buildings, they're not really aware of this. It's mostly the private sector that uh, likes to pitch their um, new iconic developments for a, a star five or, or, or six star grading. But I believe that the public sector building should at least pitch at a, 
um, four star grading for, for green star status. And then we have the triple bottom line. We are well aware of environmental, economic and social sustainability, but we need to develop metrics so that these are, are measured and incorporated um, within the IDMS and, and government delivery systems. So the key lesson from this is to lock in the governance into the performance. If we set performances and we get leadership to buy into governance, we've got something to measure them against. Then it will cascade downhill into all the performance contracts and then every civil servant will be obliged to perform because it's in his contract. If, he's, if it's not in their performance contract, they won't bother doing it. So it needs to be entrenched from the senior level right down to the lower level. And um, now we're on the, the second um, learning outcome for this webinar. And I'd really like to spend time here showing how typical uh, public sector planning starts uh, is, is happening. We have this, perm this uh, pyramid here. And um, usually most nations start off with a national development plan that drills down into provincial plans. Um, district plans, municipal plans, and so forth. Now we have the SDGs though, and the SDGs should be pitched right at the top of the pile, and they need to drill right through this whole lot. So we have top-down policies and strategies, and we have bottom-up needs, analysis, and solutions. And so if we look at the built environment, I'd say goal 13, take urgent action to combat climate change and its impact is a key imperative for the uh, built environment industry. And then we've got goal six, uh, management of water and sanitation. Goal seven, sustainable and modern energy. Goal nine, build resilient infrastructure. And goal 11, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. These ought to be now uh, embedded from the top down through all these plans. And in order to do that, we need whole systems thinking. And um, there's a whole lot of these approaches that have spawned, um, that, that have led to ecological design through whole systems thinking. If we look at permaculture, uh, ecological economics, restorative environmental design, ecological engineering, cradle-to-cradle -cradle design, and regenerative design. But the common approach here is that they're all closed loop or cyclical systems rather than linear systems. Once we get this entrenched into uh, designers and, and contractors and civil servants, then we start thinking uh, about uh, closing the loop in every manner and how we package uh, projects. Um, I'd say that out of all these ecological design approaches, um, regenerative design is probably the, the pinnacle that we ought to achieve. But it's very difficult to pitch uh, the public sector at a regenerative design level if they barely understand the basics about sustainable development. So my suggestion here is rather start off with baby steps. Start off with just a better appreciation for understanding sustainable development, but plan to move in this direction towards regenerative development. So to this end, the, the form of ecological design that um, I prefer to use is ecological economics. Simply because it's easy to explain, it balances four capitals, which is the natural, the built, the human and the social capitals, and it integrates these to achieve sustainable solutions. What we have here is the natural capital. Um, this little picture, it's on a slope. These buildings are hardly intruding on the slope. And this is a forest that was uh, re-established. Then we have the built environment, which dove dovetails into the natural environment. Human resource development is critical. If we develop human capacity, um, and involve them in the design or certainly in the construction of projects, there's a better appreciation for these assets and that starts developing the social capital, which is the glue within the community that looks after these projects. Um, 
we can then extend this ecological design thinking to master planning. So remember this is at a portfolio level and I think this is where the bi-regional planning approach um, sits quite comfortably. Thinking along watersheds, um, look at the South African example here. These are all the river catchments. And these should be forming our, our planning catchment um, areas. And this is a nice website that's well worth looking at, the Water Paradigm. It's from uh, Slovakia, and it's, they, they've adopted bi-regional planning approaches um, just to, to create more um, rainwater harvesting, uh, more water capture, and they're changing their whole temperature change just by putting more biomass um, within cities and rural areas and so forth. So that's an example of, of master planning, adopting bi-regional planning, and how, sit, how we look at cities. Some of these slides I'm going to start moving through quite quickly. Um, master planning of integrating utilities. Now, the one example that comes to mind here, uh, back home where we were staying, the municipality had this huge landfill site. There was no recycling, everything went in there. And about 40% of the material going to the landfill site is actually organic. So as that is compressed, it produces methane, and methane is up to 80 times more harmful than CO2. And when we confronted, as part of the Treasury, we confronted this uh, metropolitan municipality, we alerted them to this, and we said, why don't you compost that source? All these uh, garden waste centers, instead of trucking all the the material to the landfill site and budgeting for it, just create jobs at source through composting. So that's how we need to, to think closed loop systems the whole time in integrating utilities. Perhaps the most important slide in this presentation is, is this one here, because one could do a whole presentation just on this slide and, and ignore all the other things. These are the regulations. In other words, if there's no guidelines and you just tell the civil servants, these are the stages of a project, stage one to stage nine, and thou will do what's deliverable in each stage. That's the other way of doing it. But it doesn't get much headway because people need guidelines. So as I said earlier on, these two do go hand in hand. So the guidelines have explained at length what goes into each of these stages. But it's the, um, the standard and the regulations which actually monitor the end product of each of these stages so that now there's actually an official sign-off. You can't move a project from one stage to the other without it being signed off by a, a duly competent and authorized civil servant. And I'm going to give you an example here of how we can influence this project cycle to, to ensure value for money, but using sustainability criteria. So stage one and stage two of a project, this forms part of portfolio planning. And we start making sure that in stage one is a long-term plan. We take a long-term view. What planning tool should we be using here? So stage one, there should be a focus on bi-regional planning. When we get to stage two, the official term there is strategic resourcing. In fact, it's actually outsourcing, where a client or partner will decide who shall implement its projects because they don't have all the capacity in-house. And there's many organs of state that can act as implementing agents and they divide the work accordingly. However, strategic resourcing should all be about resourcing from the local economy. This would be the focus from a sustainability point of view. How can we package projects at this stage to make sure that the local economy um, is well involved, that materials are supplied locally, and that the local community contractors and everyone is engaged? So these are all portfolio planning processes. Actually, the, the individual projects start from stage three onwards. So stage three, this is when you appoint your architects, your engineers, and so forth. And the first thing they do, they prepare uh, what's called a pre-feasibility uh, study. 
But from a sustainability point of view, um, we should be harnessing the four capitals here. So they should be um, embedding how do we approach the natural capital, the built capital, the human capital, and the social capital. They should be fine tuning it at this stage. Then stage four is the full blown feasibility study. By this stage, we should be sharpening pencils towards a carbon neutral feasibility study. And if it's not carbon neutral, at least uh, towards it. And the end of stage four is a very critical period in a project. It either gets uh, the green flag to continue or it goes back to the drawing board. So this is where we can really influence the design at this stage. And stage five is green building design. We can really throw the, the, the green book uh, standard here. In stage six, one can zoom in on life cycle analysis. Uh, stage seven is where most of the money is spent. This, these are the construction works. So here the focus would be on health and safety aspects. And then stage eight and nine is basically the commissioning and handing over the project to the client. So here we start focusing on operation efficiencies. But remember that once a project is finished, it goes back into stage one, which is maintenance planning. So the more efficient, energy efficient we make a, a project, the less budget there is to spend when we maintain the project. So the sustainability protocols and targets, we can really embed these in each stage of the project cycle. And so there's a lot more work that can be done um, to embed sustainability within the regulations. I think this next section then moves away from portfolio and it looks at program and project management processes. So here we start zooming in on specific projects. Where can we embed sustainability? And I think the start here is design collaboration. Um, the conventional approach is, is too silo driven. You have designers, engineers, and architects, etc., all um, reporting to a project manager. That's your conventional approach. Whereas we should be having a collaborative uh, environment. And this is where people thrive and the imagination flourishes and all the best design examples start coming out. And design integration is also important. This picture really zooms in on a closed loop project approach for a building. This is open linear. This is sustainable where it's a closed loop. And the waste of one is, is the, the food of another. Um, another example of design integration is uh, this classic image of um, a complete closed loop uh, for energy. Here's the energy coming from the wind, the sun, biogas, recycling um, the black water, and making less to do with uh, municipal potable water, harvesting rainwater. This is a closed loop cycle building. And I was involved in a couple of these for uh, special needs schools. And uh, they had very high operational costs, electricity usage through geysers, the dormitories, uh, the cooking, the kitchens for cooking, the big laundries, etc. But just by putting the methane uh, extraction there from biogas digesters, one was able to reduce the electricity consumption significantly so that the methane was enough to drive all the geysers for the laundry and the dormitories, the ablution blocks, and, and also the cooking gas. So this is how we can redesign our buildings or actually even better retrofit existing buildings. Uh, here's another example of a whole systems approach for water. I won't go into these, these details. And here's another even better example across the whole wide new proposed city. This was for Hollow North. There was only one design protocol provided here, was that the, the average consumption per person per day is about 90 liters in the UK. And the design protocol here was that they could not abstract more than half of that from the aquifer. The other half had to be recycled and come from somewhere. So this was a major closed loop design approach for Harlow North. Then we got green building strategies. 
when we start zooming in on the green building design itself, we start looking at conservation strategies, bioclimatic strategies, waste management, social strategies, and energy strategies. And then lastly, we've got life cycle analysis. Um, at least about 65% of a building's uh, lifetime costs are actually arising from operation and use. And I've, I've read that even up to 85% of a building's lifetime costs are actually operational. So whatever we can do um, in the original capital investment to reduce operational costs will be a good thing. So this is where we start looking at materials and um, energy efficiencies and so forth. There's this website, Ecospecifier. I think most countries have got this type of um, online facility where you can choose your building materials and they will help you assess which are greener than others. So these are all the tools that we can use um, to, to reinform the public sector about sustainable development. So these are all done at a portfolio, program and project management processes. Now the next thing I'd like to look at is um, examples of ecological economics. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to dwell on a few of them uh, quite thoroughly and the rest we'll zoom through. But this is a typical school and these are the classrooms and the car park, the admin block, this is the school kitchen, these are the school ablutions, and the general slope. We've got prevailing cold winter winds, prevailing summer hot winds. Now the engineers in this project, they were taking the storm water and just throwing it downhill. And I said to them, no, we can't do that. Turn the storm water into swales, and uh, so we slow, uh, spread and sink the storm water and then we plant trees on the downhill side of the soil. So we start greening the school. Then the rainwater tanks, they all had these uh, very um, flimsy taps. I said, let's take the, remove the taps and we reticulate. By reticulating, we mean we join all the rainwater tanks. So we managed to join all of them and we drain them to a low point where we put three or four um, large rainwater tanks which we buried in the ground and from there we pumped up the, the rainwater to an elevator tank and gravity fed it down. This is a closed loop system. By doing this, we didn't need any municipal water supply at all. It all came from uh, the rooftops. Uh, the next time what we would say is use more renewable energy, use biogas digesters. Uh, so this is integrating the built environment within the uh, natural uh, or the built capital within the natural capital. But how about the human and social capitals? We often neglect these and for a school we should be developing a school permaculture food garden. The kids take the seeds here, they take them home, they establish food gardens there. But moreover, uh, the school garden can feed the school kitchen and provide better nutrition for the children. So this is one way of um, adopting the, the four capitals for a typical school building. Here's a housing project. Um, we've got this urban sprawl in South Africa with um, a small house in the middle of a site. It's got a large road frontage which occupies uh, a, a, a length of pipe, a roadway, and attracts a lot of costs. The alternative is to have row housing you have lower servicing costs, you've got more space for a house, and you have higher economic thresholds. How does this translate into a layout? Well, here's the conventional greenfield housing layout. You can see it's pretty monoculture, it's sterile, unsafe, unhealthy. Here's the alternative. It's got exactly the same number of housing units, except there's a little urban park, You've got social um, commercial facilities. You've got the houses for the elderly, houses for the young families, uh, allotment gardens, and you blend into the natural environment. So this is a vibrant, diverse, and safe built environment. Where would you rather live? This is how natural capital and the built capital can be dovetailed. 
And this is a nice example of uh, shack reblocking that's been happening um, in these informal settlements. This is where the community is called in. They identify a particular uh, tract of an informal settlement. They workshop the stakeholders in here and they say, how can we provide better access, water points, better supervision of kids, maybe a little play lot, uh, better security and access for um, ambulance, emergency services and so forth. So once the community is empowered, this is their result here. So this is empowered human capital, which promotes the social capital. And some of these projects have actually been built. You can see this informal settlement came up like a mushroom. Uh, hardly any space to breathe inside here, but this was a re rearranged after a while and provided better access and more security and it created an inclusive community within the space. So that's an example of ecological economics in shape really blocking. Uh, for agriculture, um, training of small scale farmers is important. This is the human capital. They establish homestead gardens. From there, they move on to the commonage. They then harness the natural capital. And then once they've got a surplus production, then we develop the agri-hubs, which is the social capital. So it's baby steps. Step one, homestead food garden. Step two, commercial production in the commonage. And stage three, uh, your agri-hub. And then from regenerative agriculture, we've got the key line system. Uh, this was developed by P.A. Yeomans, who studied landscape and he basically realized that most of the water runs down valley lines. How can we get it to infiltrate and, and come across ridges? And all he did is created a few swales that have a, a low point at the ridge and a high point in the valley line. And it's a very shallow fall, but this is how you spread water, uh, excess water from valley lines across to ridge lines. So you can rehydrate entire landscapes just through key line swales. Uh, these photos at the bottom here is undeveloped natural capital. And this is what this valley could look like if you put a small catchment dam here with swales and a saddle dam at the top. Taking this concept further, um, there are your swales. Uh, they slow down, spread and sink water. So you effectively drought proof. If there's too much rainfall, you simultaneously flood proof because you're spreading the risk. And because you've got an, an indigenous forest here or forest belt, you're also fire proofing because uh, runaway fires seldom burn through indigenous forests. They'll burn the plantations. So just by putting these series of swales or forest belts, one can effectively drought, flood and fire proof landscapes. Um, Part of regenerative agriculture is also limited till, holistic management. Um, and this uh, Dr. Christ, Christine Jones, she's done a lot of studies about uh, regenerative agriculture and its benefits. And she's managed to estimate the improvements in organic carbon, which is the humus level in the soil. Just with a 1% increase in humus, you can hold uh, 144 kiloliters of water per hectare, and you can sequestrate 132 tons per hectare. Now, these sums are, are unbelievable. Um, I've confirmed these with her, and this is research that she's been doing for years, and this is just in the top 30 centimeters of, of soil depth. So if we pack in the humus again, remember with conventional agriculture, we've released all that humus. How can we put the humus back in and rebuild this natural capital? And look at the carbon sequestration potential just from um, putting the humus back in the soil. I, I extrapolated these numbers for the South African context, as you see in this section of the table here. And I was in communication with Christine Jones and she verified that my assumptions were correct. This is how it goes. So South Africa has got 12 and a half million hectares of arable land. 
And in 2015, we put out 417,000 kilotons of CO2. Now, if we um, put humus at 1% level in all this arable land for 12 and a half million hectares, we are able to sequestrate 1,6 million kilotons of CO2, which is about four times higher than what we emit. So basically, we only need to do 25% of our arable land at 1% humus, and we can sequestrate South Africa's entire CO2 emissions. Now, this is not a game changer, and one can say that arguably, the farmers are capable of single-handedly saving the planet just through regenerative uh, agriculture. I've got two more examples to show you uh, related to this. Um, on the left-hand side here is the famous Yobani farm that Pierre Yeomans, who developed the key line system, uh, developed. It took him a few years uh, to develop his key line system, but at the end of it, he had all these small interrelated uh, catchment dams, and he rehydrated this entire farm that only got about 350 millimeters of rainfall a year. But this happened in the 1950s, 1960s or thereabouts. Sadly, what's happened now, the family has dissolved and uh, the farm is, is on the market and suburbia is creeping in on this corner here. And just ahead of that, um, Darren Doherty, who I did a course with a few years ago, he developed this picture and he says, we should be retaining Yobani Farm for its historical contribution to the whole key line and regenerative agricultural movement. So he came up with an idea, this sketch here, how can we put a, a peri-urban housing settlement? And he worked out that on this farm, there's enough water for 1,200 households, which is quite amazing. So I was so inspired by this type of image that uh, one or two years later, I was involved with some colleagues uh, who asked me to give them a bit of advice for this rural settlement in Ndumu, which was in northern Mazulu Natal. It was an area that only got periodic rainfall um, of about 650 millimeters of rainfall a year. And government was throwing money at this project. They were building new schools, a clinic, a library, and then um, retailers were, were also trying to, to, to establish a footprint, petrol stations, and there was ad hoc development. Now, how do we intervene in a situation like this? Because the town plan layout um, doesn't provide any guidelines at all. And so we thought, let's do a case study. Imagine we had a blank canvas. All we had was the contours but we knew that the town would be established on this ridge line here, and that we needed a road to go through to another settlement in the north, and there's another road going through to a settlement in the southeast. That would be the design brief. How then would we design this town from scratch? Just looking at the contours and applying the, the same design principles as regenerative agriculture, but in a town planning um, approach. The first thing we look at is we study the contours and we develop a key line system for harvesting rainfall. The next thing we integrate roadways with the swales. You can see all the roadways and then the forest belts. These are the green bits. Now we had an engineer that we drafted in on this uh, project. Uh, we, we wrote a paper that was published at the Architects Congress in Durban in 2014 about this case study. And the engineer verified that this closed loop approach to harvesting rainwater would provide more than adequate potable water for the entire settlement. We then draped the permaculture zones over it and we came up with um, commercial and public spaces here. We had, um, sorry, going back to the, the rainwater harvesting plan, you can see the, the saddle dam at the top of this, these two hills here another little saddle dam in the ridge. So this saddle dam here, if you straddle it with a park on each side, forms a nice little urban center. And then this area here is devoted for housing. You've got uh, a, 
uh, orchards and passive open space. You've got a wetland down here that you don't want to move into, but you can do agricultural allotments just above it. And so this was a blank canvas that we had now converted into an ideal town plan layout. Not to say that it could ever be built, but what we did do, we then overlaid this over the current reality and were able to zoom in and say, this area can be retrofitted, this area can be revised, and so on. But the important outcome of this study was that the government was busy building a 30 kilometer uh, bulk water pipeline because this development needed this water coming in from 30 kilometers away. And yet we proved through this case study that there's more than enough rainwater here that can be harvested for potable water for all the needs of this community and, and in the future. Um, we're getting close to the end, so this is one of the last examples, but also the forerunner of all the other slides. So when I started work as a technical assistant in the Eastern Cape uh, Provincial Treasury, um, I take my hats off to my colleagues who understood these concepts fairly well and they really embraced it and they were such an amazing team to work with. And with them we developed this uh, provincial strategy to improve infrastructure service delivery. Where you see the ticks in the boxes, these are all kind of um, sustainability items that are embedded in the provincial policy. So the vision uh, to add significant value to the four capitals of infrastructure service delivery. The mission to urgently intervene and add value to infrastructure projects in a coordinated, holistic and integrated manner in order to enhance the four capitals, natural, built, human, and social capitals or infrastructure service delivery. Here we have overarching socioeconomic development strategies. Embrace a low carbon economy to reduce ecological footprint of development. Relocalize the economy in order to reduce losses to the external economy, thus creating local jobs. Embed green building designs and renewable energies, skills training and empowerment of communities add value to the four capitals. And then the actual outcomes is, is drilling down onto these uh, four capitals. So here we have sustainability that was embedded right up front in the provincial policy. Um, and attached to the policy were a lot of the examples that you saw on ecological economics were attached as a reference to show this is how we, we wish to do things. So again, I just want to thank my, my colleagues there in the, in the Eastern Cape. And this type of strategic frameworks I find are quite useful to conceptualize um, where to pitch and, and where to leverage certain um, sustainability principles. And here's the, the second last slide. Um, what would the strategic framework for the SDGs within the four dimensions of guy education look like. So if we put climate action as a as an overall vision, we might have as our mission and value uh, SDGs, ending poverty, gender equality, reduced inequalities, and peace, justice, and strong institutions. As overarching objectives, we have issues that are kind of economically driven, um, good health and well-being, quality education, decent work and economic growth, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production and partnerships for the goals. And the more tangible outputs, which we could say or ecological outputs is uh, zero hunger, it's all about uh, sustainable agriculture, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, industry innovation and infrastructure below life below water and life on land. So just an idea of how we can package the SDGs um, within the four dimensions of higher education. And that takes us through to the conclusions. So I'd like to say that although it's still early days to judge the impact of this particular contribution to the public sector and its related IDMS and SRPD in, in South Africa, I really hope that the lessons we learned from this experience can at least demonstrate the following key learning outcomes. So 
remember the IDMS bubble, the institutional governance system, and the performance management system. These two need to be locked in. So buy in by leadership, develop baselines, and write into the performance contract that um, these targets will be met. If it's in the performance contract, it will be done. Then you've got the regulations to also bite into this and make sure that it happens. We've got the whole systems thinking approach to from a portfolio to program to project level. I hope we've got a better appreciation of uh, ecological economics and how this is perhaps one of the relatively easier approaches to embedding uh, sustainable design principles. And then the future enhancements. Uh, we should start looking inside this IDMS bubble on uh, the asset management. There's most of the budget is actually spent on existing facilities. So we need to study how do we retrofit these assets to reduce operational costs. The planning and budgeting system. Well, what we need here is planning and budgeting allocations according to sustainable development impact. What is meant by that is, I'll use the example of the, of the Eastern Cape. There's a 10 billion rand um, bypass road uh, from a national route being planned with two major bridges. And, uh, and primarily once this road is in, everyone is saying, oh, it's, gonna, it's not gonna take much time to, to travel through this particular province. Uh, but at the same time, it's an access way to get global goods in faster and, and out faster. And also the titanium mining that's proposed along the coastline, they've got, an, uh, they've got a free way to take the minerals out. Now, one should ask the question at that point, is it worth spending 10 billion to promote the global economy? What if we spend half of it to upgrade the current roads and the other half to improve rural livelihoods? So we start slowing down the rural to urban migration. We don't have a metrics yet to compare these two. And then, As you, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we've been going for a little over an hour now. I wonder um, if you think maybe we can move on to the question and answers portion. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually finished. The last one then is about sustainable procurement and, and that's the end of the slide. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm sorry that I interrupted you. It's very interesting. And, uh, Thank you so much for this uh, very comprehensive presentation, going all the way from uh, global accountability indexes to how the SDGs and the whole system thinking uh, can be framed. And, uh, and you also touched on sustainability protocols, ecological economics, the closed loop systems and uh, four capitals, so many uh, incredibly valuable concepts that you touched on here that uh, it probably takes each one of them a whole presentation of course but um, uh, I enjoy your uh, summary of these. I'd like to open it now to our uh, participants. <clears throat> Perhaps they have some questions that would like you to expand on. Uh, I'm not sure if that would be the case but um, the people on the, on the uh, webinar can post their questions in the question and answer box which is at the bottom of their uh, Zoom window there. Um, we'd rather you use the question and answer box or the, rather than the chat box because that would be a, a more organized way to address your questions. So let's give a, a, a minute or two for uh, our participants to post their questions and uh, we'll take it from there. Of course, if there are no questions, then uh, uh, we will just uh, go into the closing of the webinar. But uh, let's give a couple more minutes. I'm sure somebody will come up with something. Uh, so, so I see a question uh, being posed in the chat box. I, I was hoping people would post their questions in the question and answer. So um, uh, one of our participants says, uh, is there any tourist spot that can be shared as sustainable? I don't know if you have uh, 
any examples of a sustainably developed tourist spot? Um, I can't say offhand, but I know that a lot of the, the backpackers in South Africa are, um, you know, are, are having little food gardens, they do involve the community, they're looking at renewable energy simply because they have to. We can't rely on our parastatal energy supplier anymore. Um, and then also uh, compost toilets and such. With tourist trade, one has to be very careful about that. I'd say with the backpacker trade, uh, there's more uh, positive news about sustainable tourism than there is with the, the, the formal tourist uh, trade. So the backpackers are certainly keen to rough it out and learn a lot, but not so much the other tourists. So. Good, yeah, yeah, it's a very tricky thing because of all the regulations for uh, receiving tourists and visitors and that sort of thing. So um, mm. the whole other area of development. Well, um, if there are no other questions, a couple of people just commented um, about the, the awesome presentation and uh, the amazing presentation. And thank you as you for that. Um, I don't see any other questions. So I think I will uh, move on to closing our webinar today. Uh, and let me just uh, share my screen one more time. Um, as you'll thank you one more time, really, uh, I really enjoyed the webinar and it's, it's so deep and so many important concepts that you touched on the public sector and ecological design. Um, I want to remind people about uh, our other products and our other processes at Gaia Education. If people want to become with Gaia education, there is a simple process to follow, just uh, uh, complete some of our courses and have an interview. So you can visit our website for that uh, if anybody is interested. Next webinar will be on January 24th and it will be led by Georgi Melo, our um, facilitator for the economic uh, design course. Um, he will also give some presentations on ecological economics. I want to um, remind people that on January 14, we are starting our ecological design course. Ezio will be facilitating that course. There is an early bird special we are running, and um, I think it runs out the end of this week, but please visit our website and apply now if you are interested to receive this discount. Our other products are uh, offered at a 10% discount uh, throughout uh, this month. For people, this is a special discount for people who have attended the webinar. So you need to enter the code that you see up there on the top right corner of this slide, Live Web 2018, to receive a 10% discount on books and also on other products like the SDG flashcards that we designed to spark community conversations. Again, you need to use the code on top of the slide there to get the discount. Likewise for the Multiplier's Handbook, and also to invite people to subscribe to our newsletter and get more information about going on at Gaia Education. So follow us on social media, and thank you everybody for attending. Thank you very much, Ezio, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.